So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's my great pleasure and honor to moderate this session on future-proofing the economy in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. I think this is a very good topic. Um, I've been giving some presentations uh, like this on this topic uh, in different forums, and uh, I've tended to divide things into really big challenges we know are going to come and uh, things that are uncertain, but if they do happen, it could be really quite significant. Um, and uh, uh, I think this is quite helpful. So if I think of really big challenges, which are clearly on the way, uh, which we need to future-proof our, ourselves on, here are four. Technological change, ongoing, rapid, profoundly disruptive technological change. Um, the challenge of the Anthropocene, climate and the biosphere, demographic changes, uh, both aging and, as it were, non-aging, profound shifts in the character of the world population and population of many countries. And finally, an ongoing and enormous shift in global power, particularly associated, of course, with the rise of China. And then if we think of uncertainty, well, we've really learned quite a lot about that events which we th might think of as low probability, not inconceivable, have happened uh, um, really rather close together. So we've had an enormous financial crisis and a devastating pandemic in just 12 years. And that's reminded us of our fragility in the way such events, which we could imagine, but never quite the same as we imagined when we experienced them, um, what they can do to us. I think most people were surprised and shocked by how devastating economically, socially, politically uh, the pandemic was. And we know very well it could be, have been much worse and could be much worse. So we have future-proofing the world ec economy and our economies is clearly a very relevant topic, dealing with things we know are going to come and things which can come and which we uh, which we can be well aware of and plan for if we can. So we have uh, uh, four very interesting speakers to address this. Uh, they are uh, Mariana Yannick, who's Area Vice President um, for Microsoft in Germany and CEO of Microsoft in Germany. We have Alvin Tan, who's Minister of Trade and Industry from Singapore. We have uh, Stephanie Kelton, who's Professor of Economics and Public Policy and of, uh, at Stony Brook University, and is, of course, very well known for her writings on modern monetary theory. And, and uh, finally, we have Kira Marie Peter Hansen, member who is a member of the European Parliament. So I'm going to ask each of them in this order to address what they think first are the most important challenges that against which we need to proof ourselves. So may I start with you, Mariana? Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Hello to everybody. Um, I think the, the pandemic has really been a sort of a stress test for all of us. I think a lot of topics we discussed previously have just been put onto a, a sort of magnificent lens where we have to look at everything. And I would start with something we've been talking about a lot, and we see that digitalization is actually moving forward, but it's not moving forward in the same pace for everybody. So I would put that as a first topic we certainly have to look at, and it's also a topic that has to do with literacy when it comes to digitalization, but also to, to education. My second topic, something we experience, is certainly the topic on everything concerning in this remote everything. I think The Economist also called it the 90% economy, that we all discovered that we would actually in this world of remote everything would like to have more data. And looking at the status we're in, looking at how we are actually capable of exchanging data properly between companies, even 
within companies sitting in different continents, but also if we're talking about data-driven ecosystems, what kind of challenges we see on the, the whole data and AI part of what we're dealing with. And with that comes obviously the topic of trust, because we experience that trust is an important point. Nobody will use a technology when there is not the right level of trust. And with that comes also the topic of privacy. And privacy today is, for many companies, something they put as a gray area when it comes to how are regulation working or not working. Mm -hmm. And here, I think, from the way we need to prove and, and to strengthen our economy is really to think about how are we dealing with the topic of trust? What kind of technology do we actually want to use? It needs to be reliable, it needs to be safe, it needs to be secure. And all these topics come together and are not clear yet. And my take is that we need to work together, first of all, to have this clear picture of the future, what is actually at stake when we're using more technology, the literacy behind it, but also the safety behind it, and how as a, I would say as a society, we want to deal with it. And there are three responses, basically. There's one that is regulation, and we as a company are very clear that we need smart regulation, but there's also topics of research when we think about confidential compute. And there's obviously the biggest part that is literacy to have a mature society that is able to really decide how it wants to use technology, how it wants to deal with data, and last but not least, my last point, that's also something that the pandemic has shown, that as a society, we are not prepared to deal with cybersecurity. We have seen major state-driven cyber attacks where, as a global community, we're not prepared yet to have an answer and deal with it. And with that, I would pass over to the panel Again, thank you. Okay. Well, you've raised some very profound issues which uh, worry a lot of us. Uh, we feel, I think many of us, and even people younger than me, that we're being catapulted into a pretty scary future. Uh, so this is a very good subject. So may I turn to you, Alvin Tan, uh, to explain what you think are the big challenges that we confront in future-proofing our economies? What are the, the things that worry you? Thank you, Martin. Um, and maybe I start with you sharing about catapulting. So I've been catapulted into a policymaker role uh, over the last eight to nine months. And I've uh, gotten some time to reflect on uh, what this means. And I would like to frame it in a way in which I thought it would be quite relevant to all of us. I mean, all of us know uh, and are very familiar with Zoom. In fact, if there's one particular skill that uh, we've developed over time, is how to Zoom. Uh, we've used it, I mean, many of our students are very well aware, as are many of uh, our knowledge workers. Um, but I've, I'm not really talking about Zoom as the platform of which it's done really well. I think the stock price has risen about five times. But I'm talking about the ability to Zoom. Um, and the ability to Zoom is important here in the crisis, which I've learned, is that how can we Zoom to the present to deal with the exigencies of our time right now as the virus presents us multiple changes and multiple challenges. But then also, we need to zoom out to look at, as Martin, you had mentioned, the bigger trends that are affecting the world. So we don't navel gaze. But the ability for us to zoom down to deal with the challenges and then to zoom out again to see over time whether we are in the right direction and whether we are facing the headwinds and the challenges and indeed the opportunities well is, I think, very critical 
uh, not just for uh, the current time, but then also for our students. And let me give a few very critical examples of how this is very important. The first would be in terms of vaccines. And if you look at vaccines right now, uh, in Singapore, when we zoom down to the present, what we've done in the onset of the crisis and even before is to quickly try to secure vaccines. And that's, that means contributing uh, to the development of vaccines through funding and then quickly getting them onto our shores so that when time is required, we can vaccinate our population swiftly and systematically. And that is now zooming to the present, dealing with the issues at hand. But at the same time, we cannot be navel-gazing. We have to zoom out and look at what is on the horizon. So supply chain disruptions, for example, the availability of vaccines, the efficacy of vaccines. And what we've tried to do in Singapore then is to look four, five, six, seven years ahead. Um, we've announced recently that we've had uh, Sanofi, Thermo Fisher and others uh, to situate their vaccine facilities here. So by 2026, we will have the ability to produce end-to-end -end vaccine production. So it's not just making sure that we have the vaccines for the immediate as we zoom in, but to zoom out uh, in the future to ensure that we can have a steady supply and to overcome some of the challenges with supply chain disruptions. Another example with regards, uh, you know, in addition to vaccines, is on skilling and jobs. Um, the pandemic has not spared any of us and many of our workers, not in Singapore, but also any, everywhere else. And if we zoom down to what we've done uh, over the last year or so, we've had $100 billion worth of five budgets. Uh, we've, we've, we have a wage subsidy scheme called Job Support Scheme, where we anticipate and we think that it saved about 155,000 jobs. We then transited to something called the Jobs Growth in, in, uh, Incentive to help to spur the hiring of new workers. But that is zooming into the present. But looking ahead, we have been working for many, many years, in fact, to skill our people so that they can prepare themselves for the bigger picture. Digitalization, as Martin, you mentioned, uh, the tech disruption. And we have this uh, program called Skills Future, which is a continually evolving program where we are constantly training our people to take on jobs for the future. That includes giving them uh, uh, credits up onto $1,000 to $1,500 for them to take on modular upskilling, but also to help them to be matched with industry players that are on the forefront so that they are future ready. The third aspect is on fiscal discipline and fiscal policy. Uh, we, I mentioned earlier on that we spent uh, a significant amount, $100 billion, uh, or set aside $100 billion rather in five budgets. Um, and this means that uh, there, there could be some pressures leading up to the future. And what are we doing then? Uh, we are making sure that our reserves are well managed. We are making sure that we continue to invest. And I'll give you a good example. We have set aside $25 billion for the next five years on research, investment and enterprise uh, on areas such as smart city, sustainability, robotics and, and the likes. And so I just wanted to uh, leave with it's just this frame where we are zooming into the present. We're trying to fix the, leak, the leaks that we are facing currently, but we cannot afford to navel gaze and let the world and the trends overwhelm us. We have to zoom out to the future to ensure that we're prepared for all of the different exigencies in the future and all the trends that might affect us, uh, might affect our companies, and also might affect our people. I, I hope that's helpful. Yes, that sounds... You have the benefit of an audience. Uh, it sounds... Uh, um, I have to say, I follow Singapore moderately yes. closely uh, for about uh, 60 years. That's the price of being old. And uh, it sounds to me very much like the sort of thing Singapore has been doing for 60 years. Um, and so it's always useful to hear what you're what you're about because it's what most people end up doing somewhat later, um, if they're if they're at all competent. So let me move now, if I may, to you, Stephanie Kelton. Could you lay out what you think of as um, the big challenges for our economies, um, and I suppose particularly given what's going on in the U.S., which we are following very very closely, of course, everywhere in the world, how you view 
uh, I suppose, as a bit of an insider and an outsider, what's going on in uh, America and how well it's now positioned to meeting what you think of as its main challenges. Well, thank you, Martin. It's uh, very nice to be with all of you this morning. So uh, I, it's difficult to be to be third in line in a sense because many of you have already said uh, and raised raised many of the most important challenges. I think, you know, it would be we would be remiss to discount the importance. I think of continuing to uh, think about the challenges posed just from the virus itself and from getting the virus under control. You mentioned the United States. We are doing everything we can to reach this herd immunity of 75, 85 percent of the population. We are struggling in many ways uh, to get there. We've got, uh, and, and this is very much tied up with politics, right? We've got vaccine hesitancy. We're talking about trust, and we have issues in the United States when it comes to information and disinformation, and the American people people uh, are, are very confused in many cases about uh, the, the vaccine itself, whether they can trust the government to safely administer a vaccine that is safe and effective. We have a whole disinformation campaign happening. And so it is a challenge. And I think bringing the virus under control, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. And we all understand that different strains emerge and that, you know, resistance to the existing vaccine can continue to pose a challenge potentially for years and years to come. So I think that obviously has to be a big challenge. And I also think that you know, we came very, very close in the United States um, on January 6th to watching what was already a fragile democracy um, begin to, in a sense, unravel. I mean, we are, we are facing a number of challenges here politically, and uh, things are sort of like a powder keg in many ways. People's uh, tensions are very high. The trust in politics and with government is, in many cases, high. So there are challenges there. Inequality is an important, I think, uh, challenge we've got to deal with. We've got uh, extreme disparities in income and wealth inequality. Those uh, disparities have widened over time. The pandemic has accelerated some of those trends. So I think that's an important challenge that we've got to deal with. Climate is obviously uh, front and center for the Biden administration. And so when we look to where the U.S. is today, uh, attempting to move really what amounts to two pieces of legislation. They may put them together into a single package, but we're talking about an American jobs plan that the Biden administration has laid out asking for some $2.3 trillion to be spent. Some of that is designed to deal with uh, inequality, with climate change, with employment, joblessness, and the rest, and then an American Families Plan, which is also designed to deal with many of the challenges with respect to uh, equalizing opportunity, getting money into education, um, health care, and so forth. So we've got intersecting crises with the pandemic, with uh, employment, with climate, with housing crisis, a health crisis. And in a sense, the administration is attempting to attack all of those problems with this new proposed uh, $4.1 trillion spending package. Well, thank you very much. I think that's given us a very good idea of the, the scale of the challenges confronting the American administration, I obviously concur completely with your judgment of what they are facing and the, and the frightening condition of the political system. We'll come back to this in a moment. Finally, uh, Kira Hansen, I hope I um, that's all right if I call you that, but you will correct me if that's wrong. Um, would you lay out what you think are, uh, are the challenges, particularly from the European perspective? Yes, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, and the pronunciation is, is totally great. Uh, and I can see that my video quality isn't the best, but I hope you can still hear me. Um, and thank you very much for this invitation. I'm really looking forward to, to having this discussion with you on such an important topic. Um, I think for me, 
there's no greater challenge than the global warming and the climate crisis. Uh, and I think especially from uh, the European Union, but also developed countries in general, we have been pioneers in creating an unsustainable world. Um, and I think it's now up to us to, to deliver the answers uh, and to be the climate avant-garde uh, and take on our historical uh, responsibility and one could say pay back our debt in relation to climate. And I think uh, from my perspective and also from, from clim climate scientists, uh, we are far too unambitious on this. Uh, we've seen the Biden administration proposing to cut emissions, uh, which is uh, really great, but it's still not enough uh, to keep us below 1.5 uh, temporary degrees. Um, and the EU has also agreed to a climate target of minimum 55 uh, reduction, which is still 10 percent points lacking behind of what is needed. So I think our biggest challenge and probably will be for, for the rest of, of at least my entire lifetime and perhaps also my future children will be to tackle uh, global warming uh, and the consequences that it will have. Um, and I think the longer we wait, the more generations will, will suffer. So this is really a challenge that we have to, to take on our shoulders uh, now and ensure that we can, uh, can deliver. But I think also to be successful in this, the challenge is also to get everyone on board and to leave no one behind. Uh, because even in a wealthy country as Denmark, uh, the current centre-left government is frightened about yellow vests and social uh, instability um, and are fearing the industrial workers and the impact that the, that the green transition will have. And I think we also need to, to acknowledge that if even wealthy countries uh, as Denmark can't, uh, handle the, the climate uh, crisis and can't uh, refrain from investing in fossil fuels, it's difficult to expect countries like Poland, who have a lot of uh, coal industry, to do it as well. So having uh, a shared burden and having a fairly shared burden is super important. Um, and to make sure that the green transition will also make sure that we reseal people uh, and that we have enough jobs in the green uh, sectors in the future, um, is important to, to have the population's uh, trust in this issue. Um, and I think also when we discuss sharing uh, the, the burden of the climate crisis uh, and the, both the consequences and the, pop, uh, and the possibilities that a green transition will have, we also need to discuss how to, to make a more progressive tax system uh, and to tackle wealth inequality uh, and economic quality in general uh, and to secure that we have less aggressive tax planning uh, so that we will have a society where the wealthy contributes also to uh, to the green transition, both in individual countries, but also in a global scale. Um, because I think if we don't tackle this crisis, and that is also why I think it's important for this uh, panel debate, is that we will lose the, the trust of the people uh, that politicians can actually, uh, and, and companies and societies in general, can tackle the, the crisis we're facing. Um, and I think if we don't tackle it, uh, we will stand with a, with a fragmented democracy uh, and especially in the young generation, have a generation who have no faith in, in political decision-making uh, and democracy. So for me, that would be um, the key issue that we have to tackle. I'm uh, looking forward also to discussing how, but... I think for me in general and in short terms, it's about climate mainstreaming uh, our policy work. So in each field that we're working on, making sure that it's aligned with the Paris Agreement um, and also make sure that uh, that we leave no one behind and, and have uh, an eye on the, on the uh, consequences of people. So I'm looking forward to, to the further discussions on this. Back to you, Martin. So thank you very much. Obviously, we have limited time, and there is an enormous range of very difficult questions. Um, but I'm I'm going to try and focus on four. And uh, and the the theme that comes out, I think, of all of your interventions is trust, or rather, the lack of it. Uh, and uh, you can't, as has been said, you can't really achieve very much if people um, are deeply suspicious of your motives. Let me start with one which was sort of, in a way, brought out by Alvin Tan, um, uh, which is how we get out of the pandemic globally. This is the 
uh, you know, the pandemic, like the climate crisis, is global, is a global challenge par excellence. Our politics are, of course, national. Um, countries have very uh, different resources. So you are talking about, though Singapore is a relatively small country, it's a rich one, you're talking about future-proofing yourselves by being able to make your own vaccines, as I understand it, and in order to solve problems created by supply chains. But as a general, think about generalizing that to the whole world. First of all, it would be spectacularly wasteful. You know, all 200 countries of the world try to do it. But worse, it's pretty clear that at least 100 countries won't be able to do this. So we have a global challenge. Singapore is, I think, rich enough and came competent enough to deal with it uh, nationally in the way you, indeed, you've shown you are able to do it. But what does this mean for the, our ability to handle this pandemic challenge globally? Um, what do you think, uh, Alvin, we should be doing about that? Um, what should we be doing to make sure vaccines get to everybody? It's not enough to just save our own populations if the disease in various mutations is moving all over the world. That's a rather long introduction, but I'd be interested in what you think about that, um, uh, about that challenge from your perspective. Thank you, Martin. Well, it's... We as you rightly pointed out, Martin, we are a very small country, so we are just a little, little island in the world. Um, and foremost on our minds is how do we overcome the vulnerabilities and the, the constraints that a, a small island state uh, has to overcome. Uh, and so it's not natural that we would be a vaccine manufacturer. It's not natural that we'd be a hub for services or uh, carbon sequestration and, and trading. Um, so we always have had to, and, I, and you've, you've probably heard this many times, punch above our weight, secure, our, uh, secure the factors that will help us to overcome our vulnerabilities, but then also be relevant to the world. And how do we do that? It's the, the, when we talk about the vaccine production end-to-end -end facility that Sanofi, GSK, Thermo Fisher and others are situating in Singapore. It's not just for Singaporean consumption. Uh, it is for the region, it's for the world, and not just in terms of vaccine supply, but in terms of research, investments, and enterprise. So, and we have tried to build an ecosystem where that can be uh, created here in Singapore, where you have researchers, where you have clinic clinicians, where you have hospitals, where you have academics, to help to produce that, not just for Singapore, but for the world. And we are also very cognizant that the, the, the COVID-19 virus respects no borders. I mean, we've seen a little bit of a rise in community cases in Singapore over the last uh, week or so. We have one today, but we cannot close our borders. We don't have the luxury of a US continent or, or China. We have to open, and that's why we see a lot of uh, imports, uh, but we uh, control them, we, we, we uh, quarantine them. But we also understand that our neighbours, for example, in India and others, uh, will need us to also play a part. And that's why I think last week or the week before, uh, we and many other countries in the world recognised it and we sent 256 uh, uh, gallons of, uh, of, of oxygen through to, to India. So the main point is this, we will produce not just for ourselves, and we, in fact we cannot just produce for ourselves, but we want to be a research hub for the world and also uh, a key note in the supply chain to service the world. Over back to you, Martin. Okay. Perhaps I can just follow on okay. this theme, uh, which is uh, um, national responsibility in a global context, um, because I think that relates very profoundly to both the climate challenge and the pandemic challenge, which have already been mentioned. Um, uh, and I'd, I'd like to start with you, Stephanie Kelton. Um, the US administration has obviously been very successful in rolling out the, the accelerating vaccinations in the US. And, uh, and uh, it's also put forward, we're 
obviously very pleased to see it's returned to the Paris Agreement and it's put forward relatively ambitious proposals. Uh, but the US is obviously a very large and powerful country. Um, and there are real concern about how this is going to work globally um, in, in both cases. Um, in the case of the vaccines, getting them out to everybody. And of course, in climate, um, you know, the, the developed countries as a whole only generate about a third of all emissions now, and it's declining. The US, I think, generates half of that. So th we simply can't do climate without really deep global agreements, above all with China, India, Brazil, other important emerging countries. How do you see the politics and the discussion in the U.S.? Because I get the impression that the, well, like, there's a lot of the U.S. administration doing, I agree with it, it's quite inward-looking. And that for, other, for, out, for people outside the country, that's a bit disturbing. So how would you wish to, to encourage us or make us feel um, happy about what's going on? <laughs> well, I'd like to be able to to do that. I think that you know the the most encouraging thing, I suppose, uh, is is the change in the administration is the fact that we do now have a president who believes in the science, who understands the you know what is driving climate change, and and has, as you say, uh, the U.S. has re-entered. Paris, and he is, you know, laying out, uh, I think, a reasonably ambitious. There are arguments that uh, it is, in fact, as big as the number sounds to some, that it is uh, really too small, that we are going too slow, and that, in many ways, the program is too complicated. So um, we're talking about numbers that sound very large, but if you stretch them over eight or ten years, they are, uh, in fact, I would argue, fairly modest. And so, you know, what is the U.S. prepared to do, as you say, to be a partner to the rest of the world? We are not hearing things like uh, calls for a global Marshall Plan, where the rich countries in the world step up understanding that poorer countries, developing uh, countries, have to be brought along, that they're going to need assistance with financing, if we're talking about reaching uh, the UN's uh, SDGs or other target measures with climate, uh, with Paris, that there's going to have to be, I think, something from the rich world to recognize that there is, that we're going to have to make a financial contribution to help poorer countries come along. Now, we don't have, I think, yet a clear picture of how far the administration is willing to go. We are beginning to see uh, the kind of outreach from the U.S. with our uh, global partners. We clearly understand that this is not something that any one country can do alone. So I. I, I'm hopeful, I guess, uh, that with the change in leadership, with climate being put at the front of this administration's agenda, that we may begin to see negotiations and a solidifying of a kind of financial commitment to ensure that we're able to get where we need to get in the scale of time that we need to get there, and that the U.S. will play an important role, leadership role. Um, in in moving us forward. So let me turn this same topic, and then I'm going to come back to data, trust, and all the rest of it, to you, uh, Kira. Um, yesterday, as it happened, um, yesterday as it happened, purely by chance, I was in another webinar in which I was doing a dialogue with Franz Timmermans, uh, who, as if you, of course you know, is. Um, the vice president of the commission in charge of the Green uh, Deal. Um, and I, I did actually ask this. I, I pointed out that the EU is responsible directly for about 9% of global CO2 emissions. And, uh, and it's a declining share. So the EU can do almost anything it wants, but it's not going to affect the overall picture. Uh, uh, this is a global challenge. Uh, roughly two-thirds of all emissions are now generated by emerging and developing countries. And I, I actually had a, 
column this morning, which showed that roughly 90% of the increase in emissions expected under a business-as-usual forecast from the IMF comes from emerging and developing countries. So this sort of follows on from what Stephanie was talking about. How do you make this an effectively global program? What do you need to do to persuade countries much worse situated than, say, Poland, which you mentioned, uh, China, whole, very heavily dependent on coal, India, very heavily dependent on coal, African countries, which don't have any electricity at all, um, in many cases, people don't... How are you going to make this an effective global program? And do you think the EU has begun to think of that radically enough? Mm, it's a good point, Martin, and, and a difficult question also to answer. Um, I think, first of all, countries, regardless if they are 5 million as in Denmark or huge country like China, have to take responsibility and have to do what they can. Uh, in order to mitigate the climate crisis. Um, but I think it's also a good point that like, we need to find a way to get developing countries, and especially the, the big ones, as you're mentioning, uh, on board. Uh, and I think actually the point on, on supporting developing countries are really important here, uh, both as Stephanie and, and Alvin also touched upon, um, to make sure that we have this cooperation and that we both in, like, in mere technology uh, support countries so that they won't... Uh, gain electricity in Africa based on coal, but get based on uh, solar energy or something. So make sure that the development that these countries are facing, and which is necessary because it's also about human dignity and human rights, uh, are based on a green development instead of uh, fossil fuels development, as we've seen uh, when the Western world had to develop um, many years ago. So I think ensuring that we support a green development in, in countries uh, are the important aspect uh, but of course, also bearing in mind that even though they are polluting in large numbers now, we have the historical burden of polluting. So the economic burden lies uh, a lot with us as well. Um, and I think also what uh, Elvin mentioned on um, on like crisis not having any borders is is super important, both in, in relation to Corona, but also climate crisis and the issues we're facing here, and having uh, like understanding and developing developing in the developed world that if we support developing countries it will only it will both help us in economically uh, in ensuring prosperity both in the in the countries that have developed but also um, in in the western world um, and will also mitigate immigration and climate cat catastrophes that will have severe impacts both on on uh, on countries in the global south, but also in the Western countries. So having that understanding and having a, a free and trustful cooperation and a, and a free and cooperative trade uh, is really important uh, because I think what is uh, concerning now, also in relation to what we're doing in the EU, uh, is that we also see a backlash on free trade um, and we have difficulties figuring out how we should uh, trade in, in this new uh, area uh, or, or era of the, of the world. Uh, so to build this trustful and free uh, cooperation and trade um, with due respect of the, of the planetary boundaries, I think is important because if we just backlash into having the European Union as one block uh, with high, high tariffs uh, towards the rest of the world, and we see the same in India and in China and the US, we will just generally see a backlash in, in economics uh, in the world. Let me now turn to you, back to you, Mariana. Um, I'd like to explore in this last few minutes, uh, four or five, um, this fundamental problem of data and information. Um, obviously, the new technologies we've developed in the last few decades have been revolutionary. This webinar demonstrates that, and it's all being talked about. We, we have become digitally global in an unimaginable way very quickly. Uh, uh, new possibilities, which we never imagined, but also huge new vulnerabilities, uh, a tremendous increase in inequality between those who can fully take advantage of these technologies and those who can't or have no access to them. 
um, a tremendous problem of uh, privacy, which you mentioned, a tremendous problem of um, misinformation, uh, lies, uh, media destruction, I think of it. Uh, what are the reliable sources? And do people even care if they are reliable? This is pretty scary. Um, this is not new. We've had this with previous technologies. Um, you mentioned cybersecurity, uh, incredible vulnerability of our systems. So these are the systems we all depend on, and they are really frightening. Do you think that the policy discussion we're now having and that the, the role that companies like yours play in this gets anywhere close to actually recognizing and dealing with these challenges? If, and if not, what should we be doing? Thank you, Martin. I think you depicted so well this, this huge and, and you're, this complexity we are dealing with. I think, you know, the, the first step is always to recognize this complexity and also recognize these clear trends. And for that, I think we must be grateful actually to what the pandemic has taught us. And um, the pandemic has taught us that this complexity is really real. While before we started talking about, now everybody is also experiencing it. So um, it's like, you know, trying to, to cut the elephant in pieces and, and find structures where we can all work together as humanity. Because what we see is clearly that in this remote everything um, economy, um, technology plays a big role. A lot of companies are turning into software companies but still the level of trust we need to be able to continue to do business with each other is paramount, but also, you know, governments need to use technology and, and need to also, I would say, role model how to do it. So to come back to your question on this complexity, I think, first of all, as an industry, but also as a broader community around the world, it's, it's important to talk about three things. One is the sort of the self-inflicting regulation principles companies can come up with, can be role modeling to other companies. Um, also, you know, thinking about things like a Hippocratic oath for developers, for example. These are things that can be very, very powerful. Also think about certain certification for people developing um, algorithm and machine learning. The second part for me would be to really start talking about what we need to do in our education systems with a, a lot more investment and clarity from our governments, because that has been a big topic. And if I take Germany, I mean, the country is not there where the country could be, given the, the economic potential it has. Looking at the education system, this is something that should not be there. And the third part is to tackle this huge regulation topic. How can we work together, companies, association, regulators, um, to understand, first of all, what needs to be modernized? Because I think we have a lot of regulation that have a clear purpose, where actually the regulation itself is good in itself, but just need to be modernized. So that's a first topic to look at. And then certainly we have things that are completely new, we haven't experienced, and where we have to find the right structures to interact constantly and to, to be very honest to, to each other to see what are you know, possible effects. And we will need a lot of academia also at the table to conduct these kinds of, of discussion. So for me, it's really paramount to to intensify this discussion, because the problem will not go away. The pandemic has shown that technology and this hunger for data uh, is not going away. We need to find things to work on technology to protect us, to have the right education and literacy around the world. And a company as we are can certainly contribute a lot and then have these kind of structures to work on smart regulation, you know, starting with the EU, for example, 
That would be a good, good start. And we've shown as an EU that we can do things when we look at data privacy. EU was really role modeling it. So I'm still positive that we can do something. Um, still, the challenge is, is huge. But we need to start, you know, intensifying, discussing about, about technology and what it can do. And, you know, on both sides, the good and the bad. So I'm unfortunately, we've only really just started. This is an unbelievably gigantic topic. Only in St. Gallen would they expect us to get rid of this in 45 minutes. Anyway, we've started the topic. I would say uh, sort of two big things. Um, we have to recognize some huge challenges that are clearly there. We already know they're there. And the known knowns, and some of them are enormous, like climate, like technology. We have to recognize the known unknowns, the fragility we have shown again and again. And the final point I would make is that there is a tremendous temptation nowadays. Uh, I think Kira brought this up very well, to think that we can solve these problems nationally. Uh, but in fact, the problems we've talked about are all global. We have created a global civilization, the, the, probably the first truly global civilization, and we are not all tempted by the idea that we can close the drawbridges and treat our countries as islands. And I think if we do that, we are completely finished. Uh, so anyway, I think it's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you, panelists. And I hand uh, the floor back to the organizer of the St. Gallen Symposium.